Yeah. Okay. Well, we're talking about the Kelsey man over here. Oh. Like Travis Kelsey? Yes. He has a brother. What other Kelsey? Did they played play each other in the Super Bowl? Oh my god. Oh, that's so sad. Alright, anyway. Did they play each other in the Super Bowl? Apparently. Oh, I didn't Did you know that? Okay, good. Okay, so let's, let's talk about that. Uh, worksheet that I gave you all way, way back last Wednesday, which seems like an eternity ago. So let me kind of take you through the process. Oh gosh, Everybody's cool with what we got because that's going to roll into the lab that we're in to today. So what you have is this. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are we doing a lab today? Yes. Oh, very nice. Okay. So, I found your Twitter, and there's a video of you doing the YMCA. <laughs> that was to raise money for the Solar Foundation. <laughs> very good. I like against my will. Did you donate? Yeah, me and Coach Brogman. Yes. Okay. So, let me kind of take you through this process. So, what you have, what you were given here, is what's known as the skeleton equation. It is not balanced in any way, shape, or form. All that's telling you is say, hey, here's what's going on. So to do these half reaction methods, this is what the technical name is, balancing redox by the half reaction method. So there's two steps to this. Oddly enough, there's the reduction part and the oxidation part. And you can't do either one until you figure out what the oxidation states are of every element involved. So that's the first thing that you have to figure out. And if you can't do that step, then there, you can't do anything else. Because if you don't know what the oxidation states are, you don't know if they gain electrons or if they lose electrons. So on this first one, and this is what you give it. So what's going to happen here is that you have permanganate ions, and that's one of the things that you're going to have in the lab today. That's actually MnO4. Okay? And we're going to use that a lot because it's, it's fairly common. And then you have sulfurous acid, H2SO3, H2SO3, not sulfuric, H2SO3, makes it a weak acid. And then you have the H+. So all the H+, is telling you is that this is, you're going to have an abundance of hydronium ions. So when you balance things and you do these reactions in acidic environments, you always have to have a source of free hydronium ions. So like the lab that you're going to do today, you're going to dump in one and a half molar H2SO4. You want something else to be the limiting reactant. Like you want the MnO4 to run out, or you want the sulfurous acid to run out. You overload it with hydronium ions so that that doesn't run out. It's like, okay, we're going to let the reaction go, but we're not going to worry about the hydronium ions running out. So if you go through here and you figure out what's happening with this reduction. So on this MnO4, and like I said, this is one of the most common ones, and this is what you're going to do in the lab today. So your oxygen always starts off at 2 minus, unless it's hydrogen peroxide, okay, which is very, very rare. So that becomes minus 8. This becomes, that means that, that, magne that manganese ah, had a charge of 7 plus. Okay, so what you'll see is that the permanganate ion wants to end up in Mn2 plus. Okay, so what's going to happen is that it's going to go from 7 plus to 2 plus. So here's the million dollar question. When it went from 7 plus to 2 plus, did it gain 5 electrons or did it lose 5 electrons? It gained 5. Gained 5. Okay, because you went from 7 plus to 2 plus. Since it gained electrons, was it reduced? Or was it oxidized? Reduced. It was reduced, which means the MnO4 is an oxidizing agent. So, in terms of your half reactions, if you do this right, there are checks and balances along the way to make sure that you have done this right. So, come in here and you're going to go, okay, MnO4. 
So this thing is going to gain five electrons. So I'm going to start over here so I have a little bit more room. The MnO4 minus. That's going to gain five electrons to turn into Mn2 plus. Okay? Now, I've got to balance this thing with my oxygen. So on the back side of that sheet, I take you through the steps. You do this, then you do this, then you do this. So I've got four oxygens. So I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to put four water molecules. That gives me my four oxygens. Okay? That's how you balance your oxygens and your hydrogen ions if you need to. But now I've got eight hydrogens. Ah, I'm going to come over here, and then I'm going to put eight hydronium ions. So at this point, here's how you can check that this thing is balanced. I've got one manganese. I've got one manganese. I got four oxygens, I got four oxygens. I got eight hydrogens, I got eight hydrogens. That's cool. Now, here's the most important thing. One of the great laws of, of science is what's known as there are certain conservation laws. Conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of charge, conservation of mass. Okay? So what this means is that when you get done, both sides should balance in terms of number of particles and charge. So if I come over here and I add this together, so I've got eight positive charges here, and I've got five negative charges there. Okay, that leaves me at three plus. Then I've got an overall negative charge here. That knocks me down to plus two. So the sum total of all my charges on this side is plus two. Okay? Now, I come over here. Ah, there's only one thing that has a charge over here, and that's that manganese. That has a charge of plus two. So when you get done with a half reaction in either oxidation or reduction, this is how you can check that you got it right. If everything balances with charge and the number of particles, odds are you did it right. Not guaranteed, but at least the odds are in your favor. If this doesn't add up with charge or number of particles, it's a train wreck. Okay, there's no way to compensate for it. Well, one's one plus, the other one's two plus. One plus two, close enough. No, 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 no. This is a law of conservation of charge. This isn't a suggestion of conservation of charge. It isn't, well, oh, kind of, maybe, no. Okay, no. This is a law. And if you get done with this step and it's not balanced, it's a train wreck. Okay, you got to regroup. And don't ignore it and go, well, it's a, it'll be okay. No, it won't. Okay, it won't be okay. This is a law. All right, now, if you look at what happens with the oxidation, okay? So this is H2, H, H2SO3, sulfurous acid, turning into HSO4 minus. Okay, now, if you look at the oxidation states of sulfur on this one, so... The, the sulfur is going to change, and if you go through, it's going to gain, it's going to lose two electrons over here, okay? Now, this is where you work the water and the hydrogen ions. Hey, I got four waters over, or four oxygen on one side. I got one over here. I'm going to put a water over here, and then over here, I've got four hydrogens. I got two with the water. I've got two with the sulfurous acid which means I've got to balance the hydrogens over there, but I'm going to put hydronium ions, okay, because that's why it's done in an acidic environment. So then I'm going to put three hydrogens over here, okay? Now, here's what's most critical. Again, this is how you can check that you got this right. i got four hydrogens. I've got a total of four hydrogens. I've got one sulfur. I've got one sulfur. I've got four oxygens. I've got four oxygens. Now, notice with this, when everything should add up to equal to zero. And that's what's going to happen here. Because if you notice, I've got a negative charge here. I've got two negatively charged electrons. That adds up to negative three. I've got three positive charges over there. That adds up to equal to zero. Okay, so I've got a zero sum on one side. I got a zero sum on the other side. Okay, so if you have zero on one side, that doesn't mean that you can't have charges on the other side. It just has to balance out. 
so that both sides add set to equal to zero. Now, here's the most critical step. The number of electrons lost has to equal the number of electrons gained. So you come in here and you find five electrons here and two electrons here. The number of electrons lost has to equal the number of electrons gained. So you find the least common multiple of five and two. The least common multiple of five and two is 10. Ten. So I'm going to multiply everything by two, and I'm going to multiply everything by five. Okay? I can't just do the electrons. You have to multiply everything. So when you do this, this becomes two, this becomes 10, that becomes 16, that becomes two, that becomes eight, that becomes five, that becomes five, that becomes five, and that becomes 15. Now, at this point, you're going to add these two equations together. Okay? Now you're going to add these together. So here's what you want to look for. First off, if you do this right, your electrons should cancel out. So if you look at this, I've got 10 electrons on this side. I've got 10 electrons on that side. They're going to cancel out. If, you, if your electrons don't cancel out, you're, it's a train wreck right from the beginning. Okay? Those are going to cancel out. Now, if you look at the waters, over here I've got five waters as a reactant. Over here I've got eight waters as a reactant. So, as a product and a reactant. So, what that means is that I'm going to end up with the net value of three waters as a product because I've got five and I've got eight. Oh, that sums up to a total of three waters. Then over here, I've got eight hydrogens on one side. I've got 15 hydrogens on the other. That's going to, that's going to reduce down as well. So you can cancel out electrons. You can cancel out waters. You can cancel out hydronium ions. And you're going to add these together. So when you get done, here's what you should get. So, oh, that's horrible. 2MnO4 minus plus one hydronium ion plus 5,2-HSO3, 2-MN2 plus 5-HSO4 minus plus 3 waters. So when you get done, again, there's no real excuse to miss any redox reaction. Because if you do this right, everything is going to balance out. The sum total of all of the charges on the reactant are going to add up to the sum total charge of everything that's on the product side. And if they don't, don't ignore it. Go, plus 2, plus 3 is close enough. No, okay? Either the oxidation states add up or they don't. And if they don't, stop, okay? It's wrong. There's no exceptions to this. Like, oh, it's, it's, Burkamp's just railing. It's okay if we're close. No, this is not horseshoes. Okay? You have to be exact. So, everything should balance with charge and the whole smash. Cool with that. Now, when you look at that next one, let me point out what's going to happen in this next one. Bro, I thought you meant actual horseshoes. I was like, man, I feel like if you're not exact, I would hurt Close the horse. Close only counts when it comes to horseshoes and hand grenades. That's yeah, that's the expression. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Or nuclear weapons. Or nuclear weapons. Or, or, or nuclear what do you mean? So it does count? Yeah, because in horseshoes, if, horseshoes, if nobody... Like, I thought I said... If you're tied on who has the same number, like, on the post, then it's whoever's closest. Why do you know about horseshoes? Yeah. It's a common thing. Okay. You don't know how <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's talk about this next one. So you have dichromate, okay? Dichromate is kind of an orangish powder. Okay, it's most powders that we do in chemistry are, are white. This is one of the ones that's unique because it's orange. So when you do this one, again, you have to start with what you have. So you have 
seven oxygens, each one of those is minus two, that gets you minus 14. So everything has to add up to negative two, so that means your total chromiums have to be 12. That means each chromium is six plus. So, so, so if I take two times six plus, I get the 12 plus. I take 12 plus plus the negative 14, I get negative two, okay? Now, on the right side, you're told, hey, you have CR3 plus. So here's, and you have to do this in the sequence. So I've got two chromiums here. So I'm gonna put two chromiums on that side. Do that first before you do the electrons, okay? So here's what's happening, is that each chromium is going from six plus down to three plus. So you have three electrons that are involved, okay? But you have two chromium atoms involved. So you have a total of six electrons, okay? So here's the most common mistake that's made. You go, oh, chromium is going from six plus to three plus. I'm only gonna put three electrons there, which is true for each atom, but there's two of them. So that's why you have to double that up. So come over here and I'm gonna put six electrons over here. Now, at this point, I've got seven oxygens. Oh, I'm gonna put seven waters over here. There's my seven oxygens. Now I balance that out. Oh, but now I've got 14 hydrogens. Oh, so now, I come, now I've gotta come back over here and I gotta put 14 hydrogens. Now I'm done. So when you, again, when you balance this, you're gonna balance with oxidation charges and you're gonna balance with number of particles. If you do that, everything should balance out. Now, on the oxidation, that's the reduction part. On the oxidation part, here's what you have to watch. You have I1 minus turning into elemental iodine. So if you, if you actually see this reaction, elemental iodine is a brownish orangish color. So what would happen in this reaction is that you would see elemental iodine forming in the bottom of this beaker. Okay, and you'll, and you'll do, not in this react, not in today's lab, but you'll do this in another lab. When you see elemental iodine form, it turns into this brownish, orangish liquid. Okay, it's one of the few elements that are liquid, that's a liquid at room temperature. But again, here's the deal. You got two iodines, so I gotta put a two over there. I've gotta balance that out, so I'm gonna put two electrons over here. Okay? Don't look at this and go, oh, iodine goes from one minus to zero. It does, okay? But there's two of them involved. So that's why you have to double that up. So the next thing you want to do is look at this and go, oh, I got two electrons here. I've got six electrons there. I've got to multiply all of this by three. So that way I have six electrons on one side and I get six electrons on the other. So if you do that second one right, you should end up with, I'll just give you some hints. You should end up with seven waters on the product side and 14 hydronium ions on that side. Okay? Are we good with that? Good? Once, twice sold? Okay. Get that handed in. So is the reason? Okay. Back to the okay. So there's two distinct parts to this lab, okay? So the first one you're going to do is a series of redox reactions, oddly enough, involving elements and compounds. So what you're going to do is that you're going to take two pieces of copper, okay, I've got little strips of it, and then you're going to take two pieces of lead, and then you're gonna have two pieces of zinc, okay? So you're gonna have three different solutions, what we call reagents. You're gonna have copper nitrate, you're gonna have lead nitrate, and you're gonna have zinc nitrate, okay? So oddly enough, it won't be, do any good to put copper nitrate solution on pieces of copper. Because oddly enough, nothing's going to happen because everything's copper. 
So the first thing you need to do is you take those two pieces of copper, and you're going to take a watch glass. Remember, the watch glass is like that big, it's a clear piece, looks like a huge contact lens for like an elephant, okay? That's going to be your watch glass. You get the visual. Now, I've also got stereoscopes in those. And the stereoscopes take the watch glass. Stereoscope is like a microscope. Okay, but it's used for viewing like larger things, not necessarily like the small amoeba gross stuff that makes up biology. So you take your wash glass and take the two pieces of copper, and then you're going to put lead nitrate on one, and you're going to put zinc nitrate on the other one, and watch them underneath the wash glass, and you're going to see what's going to take place. Now, understand the physical nature of what's taking place. So when you have that piece of copper, what we're saying is that you have these chunks of solid copper, okay? Element of copper. And along comes, say for example, the lead ions. So here's the fundamental question. Will those lead ions, which are missing two electrons, do they have the capacity to come up to that copper take away the electrons from the copper, and then form elemental lead and copper ions. Okay, that's the fundamental question, is that it's a tug of war for electrons. Do the lead ions have the capacity to come up to the copper and go, so, give me your electrons. And will the electrons from the copper transfer over? If they do, what you will see is that you will see crystals of lead forming on the copper, and you will see the copper dissolving. Okay, if, if that happens, okay, that's, what, that's what's going to take place. Eventually, what you're going to do is you're going to reverse this, and you're going to take a piece of lead, and then you're going to put copper ions in it. And then it's the same question. Do the copper ions have the capacity to come up to the lead, form elemental copper, and the lead go into the solution. So one of the things you're going to use is this standard reduction table. Okay, so this is just the opening salvo of this big, long discussion about how to use this chart. So what some people like to do is what's called the over-under game. So if you look at a reaction that you know takes place, like for example, you all know that if I, and we did this last Wednesday, if I take that piece of magnesium and I drop that into hydrochloric acid, you know a reaction is going to take place. So that magnesium, and again, this is elemental magnesium. So if you look down here, you have elemental magnesium. And remember, the farther down you are on this chart, the less it wants to go in this direction. The farther up you are on the chart, the more it wants to go in this direction. So, and you have to keep track of what form these things are in. Because there's a huge difference between elemental magnesium and magnesium ions. So when you take that piece of magnesium, you're starting on the right side of this chart with elemental magnesium. And if something happens, that reaction is going to get reversed, and you're going to form magnesium ions, and it's going to give up two electrons. This is a reduction chart. If you reverse it, it turns into an oxidation reaction. That's why it's called a redox reaction. So up here, you have hydrogen. Hydrogen is defined as like the zero value. So if you look at what happens, you have H plus turning into hydrogen gas, and that's what's going to happen, okay? The magnesium gets reversed. So what happens here, if you play the over-under game, some people like this thought process. Oh, the magnesium is below the hydrogen. That means if I drop in elemental magnesium, that reaction is going to go in the opposite direction, okay? I'm going to form magnesium ions, and the hydrogen is going to go in the direction as it's written, okay? Now, if you do this, hydrogen has a value of zero. That's like the benchmark. We said, okay, we're arbitrarily going to define 
hydrogen as being zero volts. That's it. Let's call that zero. Now, down here, that magnesium gets reversed. That becomes positive 2.37. So one of the things you'll see later on is that if you end up with a positive E-naught value, when you add together the one that goes in this direction and the one that gets reversed, if your E-naught values are positive, the reaction is spontaneous and it's going to take place. If your E-naught values add up to negative values, it's not spontaneous and it won't. the reaction won't take place. So if you want to think through and go, oh, look what happens with magnesium. Magnesium is down below. It gets reversed. I end up with a positive 2.37. The hydrogen goes as it is written. There you go. Now, let me give you some hints. Look at the three big elements that we use a lot in jewelry. Copper, silver, and gold. Those are the three. Those are the big three. Copper, silver, gold. Why do you think we use copper, silver, gold in jewelry? Because they don't react with that. They're stable. Okay? I don't listen. Oh, Valentine's Day tomorrow. Here, honey, here's the lithium ring. Oh, that's cool until she gets water on it. And then it's just going to violently react. And it's going to be a huge exothermic reaction. And bad things are going to happen. Okay? I don't recommend it. Now, silver, though. Oh, silver is cool, right? Hey, hey, we could go out in Colorado. We can go panning for silver and gold and, and those type of elements. Because they're stable. They don't react with water. So... When you look at the things that are stable in terms of jewelry, notice that they're up here in the top part of this reaction. Because of the fact that if you look at what's going to happen here, these elements, copper, the silver, the gold, they really want to gain electrons and end up as the elemental form of this stuff. The ones down below want to reverse, and they want to give up their electrons and turn into ions. So this is why somebody says, hey, let's go out to Colorado and let's go panning for lithium. Okay, see if we can find some solid lithium. We can sell it to the battery people. Okay? No. Okay? Lithium does not exist as lithium in nature. It exists as lithium ions. Okay? But it doesn't exist as chunks of lithium because it reacts with water, reacts with the air very easily. Okay. So what you're going to do is you're going to set up a chart. Okay? And I don't care how you do the chart. Uh, what you might do is something like this, where you put, because uh, you're going to make have a total of six different observations. So what you might do, this thing, stupid thing, would erase, is go something like, oh, here's copper. Uh, lead, and zinc, and then you could have the reaction with copper nitrate, the zinc nitrate, and the lead nitrate, okay? So obviously, copper and copper nitrate don't do the reaction because nothing's going to happen. Don't do the reaction with lead and lead nitrate, nothing's going to happen. Zinc, zinc nitrate, nothing's going to happen. So what you're going to have is like six cells. So the reaction between lead and copper ions, the reaction between zinc and copper ions, the reaction between copper and zinc ions, copper and lead ions, lead and zinc, zinc, boom, there you go. Okay, so that's going to be the first part. Pretty simple. Take a dropper, put some drops on the metal. I wouldn't completely submerge the metal. I'd put it like on half that way when you look at it underneath the stereoscope. And if reaction's going to take place, you will see a reaction take place. Three of them should, three of them shouldn't. Okay? Now, the next part. You're going to take, I emphasize, a very few number of crystals of potassium permanganate. I'm going to have a tweezer. Potassium permanganate is very, very bright purple. You are literally going to take a pair of tweezers and you are out of that jar you're going to grab a few crystals, weigh it. It's going to be very small amount. You're going to dissolve that in 10 milliliters of water, okay? And you'd be surprised how, those, how, num how that small number of crystals makes that color so vibrant in that beaker. So then you're going to measure out about six crystals of ferrous ammonium sulfate. This is like a lime green. It's going to be on the other side of the scale, okay? About six. Okay, then you're going to do, dissolve that in five milliliters of water. 
Then you're going to add 12 drops of one and a half molar sulfuric acid to the iron sulfate solution, and then you're going to begin to add the potassium permanganate to that. Stir it until hopefully it goes clear. That's what should happen. So, so that not everybody's kind of milling around doing the same thing, because these are like two, two completely separate things. So, half start with the potassium permanganate and the iron sulfate. That one goes pretty fast. Other half start with the solutions. It's a fairly simple lab. You have a bunch of questions to answer, okay? And I tell you, like for the reactions that took place, Write the balance reduction equation, the balance oxidation reaction, and then you're going to add these two equations together. So what I want on question number one, you're going to have something like maybe like uh, hmm, Cu2 plus plus two electrons turns into copper. Okay, so that might be your reduction equation. Your oxidation might be Pb2 plus turning into Pb2 plus plus two electrons. So you're going to have an oxidation half reaction. You're going to have a reduction half reaction. And then you're going to add them together. And the two, you should see the electrons cancel out. So on number one, you're going to have three reactions. You're going to have the oxidation. Label it. Here's my oxidation. Then you're going to have the reduction. And then you're going to add them together, and you should see the electrons cancel out, and you end up with this nice balanced redox reaction at the end. You're going to need that chart to answer some of the questions on the questions to be done at the end. So when you get done with the copper and the metal and all that good stuff, that I'm going to have re I'm going to have a container. Put anything with the solids in that container. Do not wash the solids down the sink. Okay. The potassium permanganate and the iron sulfur or the iron solution that can go down the sink. Okay. The second part can't. But anything with the solid copper, lead, or zinc has to go in that container. Go be free.